So welcome everyone to our second and final session on sound walls. So last week we talked about uh, curriculum. We talked about where does the sound wall, wall belong. This week I want to spend just a little bit of time uh, talking about um, some other parts of the sound wall and a little bit of research. So we acknowledge that we are on traditional treaty lands, home of Métis, Inuit, and other diverse Indigenous peoples whose ancestors have marked their territory since time immemorial, a place that has welcomed many peoples from around the world to make their home here. So overall, our objective has been to look at the shift from word walls to sound walls, uh, developing the purpose of a sound wall, finding a way to do the implementation. We're gonna do some playing with that today, looking at scope and sequences and what could work. And we're gonna talk about, um, I want to turn that on a little bit, um, some assessment and or we have been and about um, maybe taking some time to do some planning. So this week, review and research uh, what we did last week and uh, looking at uh, some of the pieces about uh, the research in the work for of sound walls. We're gonna do some practicing, um, suggesting a scope and sequence, how to do implementation, some assessment. How do we work with whole class, but how do we do small group? So in our last session, we started off with the questions about the Jamboard. And I am going to put that into the chat again. There's the chat and it is, Make sure I type that in correctly. I like using these bit.ly uh, links so much shorter. Thank you. All right. So go back and see are there any questions uh, that you want to add to our Jamboard um, just to see if maybe that uh, might be helpful in sort of um, supporting our conversation today. Now, let me just turn off the noise. There we go. All right. Okay, so um, in just going to the Jamboard, uh, looking to see if there's any other questions, uh, we're gonna go back to our first day. Um, explanation, how to use them, how to model them for kids. We'll be doing that today. Uh, what else should we do? What literacy centers? We'll be talking about that, incorporating it into your daily program. And that's always a struggle, isn't it? Um, then it depends that you're going to do a uh, whole class. Is it just for small group? And should a sound wall replace a word wall? The short answer, yes. The, the long answer is yes but you will be adding words to a sound wall. So we're creating sort of a, um, a sort of a, a morphed rendition of a word wall so that it's a little more meaningful. Um, helping students with spelling and hopefully as you go through the word wall, or sorry, goodness, the sound wall, that will become um, something easier for kids to do and more interactive. And uh, I'll be talking about the UFLY um, program here and um, how they talk about doing uh, portable sound walls. And then um, we didn't have any specific things about favorite activities that you already do. What are your favorite resources that you're using? and other questions you still have. So we wanna come back to that. It helps in our conversations to be able to do that. So last week also, we talked about that phonological awareness being that umbrella term and how important it is to understand that phonemic awareness is under that umbrella. And all of this together is what supports 
the teaching and the learning for students. In talking about um, the bottom part of Scarborough's reading rope, we said that it was also really important to have that language comprehension piece and all of the, those five strands that are woven together. But it is the uh, work of a sound wall to fit into the bottom part in phonological awareness, decoding and spelling, and sight recognition. Because as we approach it from the very basics in a sound wall, we're building all of those skills. And the whole idea is to eventually build um, uh, the orthography of the words and get those words and that those patterns into the long-term memory. That's how things become more increasingly automatic. We looked at this and I'm, I'm going to play it just one more time because uh, it's very quick, but just a reminder of what we're looking at. want to dance. <laughs> okay, so that's one look at a sound wall. This is another look at a sound wall, but let's um, pull in some of the research. Now, one of the things that I want to mention that I often get asked about is, what is the research on sound walls? And the answer is, or at least the short answer right now is, there isn't any. But the long answer is that there are a lot of pieces of research out there that do support the use of sound walls because sound walls is about phonemic awareness, phonological awareness. It is about building the decoding, the encoding piece, that, that reading and the spelling piece. And so I want to share that with you. And um, let's take a look from the National Reading Panel. So we we talked about those five pillars of reading that came out of the National Reading Panel, where we had phonemic awareness, phonics, fluency, comprehension, and um, what did I miss? Phonics, fluency. What did I miss? Phonics, phonemic awareness, phonological phonics, fluency, vocabulary, comprehension. I knew there was one. So in the National Reading Panel in the year 2000, there was a lot of information that came out. So this comes from uh, section two about phonics. And uh, in section two, it talks about there were some phonics programs in the database that taught spelling patterns and the use of the analogy strategy to read words. And it came out with it may be important for phonics programs to include systematic instruction in reading fluency and automaticity when phonics is taught to older students. And a few of the programs also noted that very likely phonics programs that emphasize decoding exclusively and ignore the other processes involved in learning to read will not succeed in making every child a skilled reader. So we cannot do these things in isolation. Within the, um, this whole 
National Breeding Panel meta-analysis, which is what it was. There was the Torgerson study, and it noted that preventing reading failure in young children with phonological processing disabilities, the responses to Ill, um, instruction were uh, two different kinds of phonics programs. One was phonological awareness with synthetic phonics, and that phonemic awareness instruction with articulatory gestures. These are those mouth form cards that I'm going to show you and talk to you about, um, associated with each phoneme by analyzing their own mouth movements as they produce speech. And the other was embedded phonics that was systematic, but less explicit than phonemic decoding. So it was very important that we had both that we just did not rely on phonics, but that's been very often what has ended up doing. Later in the study, there were 11 questions that were asked. I'm only gonna share two of them here that are helpful to our conversation. Does systematic phonics instruction help students learn to read more effectively than unsystematic instruction or instruction with no phonics? So, the response was children's reading was measured at the end of training. The overall effect size uh, was uh, 0.44. And we know that anything is, that uh, is that large is significant. Findings provided solid support for the conclusion that systematic phonics instruction makes a significant contribution to children's growth in reading then do alternative programs providing unsystematic or no phonics instruction. Question 11 said, is enough known about systematic phonics instruction to make recommendations for classroom imp implementation? But what are the cautions? So phonics teaching is a means to an end to be able to make use of letter sound information children need phonemic awareness. It's not even just a suggestion. That is, they need to be able to blend sounds together decode, to decode words, and they need to break spoken words into their sounds to write words. And programs that focus too much on letter sound relations and not enough putting them to use are unlikely to be effective. So overall, what they're saying, and there's a, a lovely summary on reading rockets, to become good readers, children must develop phonemic awareness, phonics skills, the ability to read words and text in an accurate and fluent manner, and the ability to apply comprehension strategies consciously and deliberately as they read. That also includes the comprehension piece includes uh, vocabulary. This is a study that came out of um, Appalachia it is the evidence-based practices for teaching phonological and phonemic awareness. So this was um, has a number of different um, parts. So I'm going to click on it. So this is the, the study. Oh, it goes right near the back end. This is the study that talked about um, building those skills. And I just took a screenshot of what you see on the screen, um, on the slide. And just being able to click on one of those when you have the link and it gives you some um, specific strategies. Um, Elkonin sound boxes. And notice it said specifically sound boxes as opposed to uh, letter boxes. So I'm gonna leave you with that one because, oh goodness, because it's just a really good um, study that was done from Regional Educational Library and talks about all, a bunch of different strategies that could be used, evidence-based practices. This is one um, video from a selection of videos on their site that um, this one talks about segmentation.
there is sound, honestly, it's coming. This happens to be a kindergarten group. The ability to hear syllables and words is an important part of phonological awareness. Hearing syllables and words will help provide the foundation to decode words when reading and writing. Blending and segmenting syllables is considered a precursor skill to phonemic awareness and letter sound knowledge. Blending syllables requires the students to put together syllables of a word that were spoken separately. For example, if the teacher says picnic, the students would say picnic. Segmenting syllables requires the students to break a spoken word into syllables. For example, if the teacher said table, the students would say table. Ready? Okay, remember we've been talking about syllables, and syllables are parts of the word, okay? okay. Remember, the, the words are broken down, so I want you to watch me. I'm going to say the word flower. Flower, okay? Now, can you say flower? Flower. Okay, now we're going to break flower apart. Flower. Okay, now watch. Are you watching? I'm going to blend it back together. Flower. Okay. Flower. Right, now let's read flower. Okay, now I'm going to let you try. Okay, so I'm going to give you the cards. I want you to line up the cards together. All right. Okay, so they're together. Ready? Mm -hmm. The word is monkey. Say monkey. Monkey. Okay, separate the word by syllable. Monkey. Okay, now blend it back together. Monkey. Okay, say turtle. Turtle. Okay, let's break it apart. Turtle. Okay, let's blend it back together. Turtle. Great job. Let's try apple. Apple. Okay, let's blend it back together. Apple. Good job. Let's try the word puppet. First syllable, pup. Puppet. Okay, blend it back together. Puppet. Okay. Well, I think you get the idea. And the same would hold true, not just with syllables in, in words, but also um, in the individual sounds in a word. We do the same strategy as we're doing uh, dog. D Og, you know, we've got more pieces of paper though, which is why El Conan boxes come in a little more handy because we could use the three boxes of El Conan boxes and just use little chips in each one. This document uh, from What Works Clearinghouse uh, looks at foundational skills to support reading you know, for understanding in kindergarten through grade three. So in this particular document uh, from What Works Clearinghouse, and What Works Clearinghouse um, takes a lot of different things and looks for the research to support the particular learning. And it pulls it together into a document. This one has 123 pages. Uh, let me just go to the table of contents and looking at the recommendations specific to recommendation two, develop awareness of the segments of sound in speech and how they link to letters. And then recommendation three, where it focuses on decoding, analyzing, writing, and recognizing words. So it's a good document to, to take some time to look through. This one, I. If you recall this visual from last week where we said those steps of phonological awareness and how important they are. Um, we start with rhyming alliteration, then segments, uh, sentence segmentation, syllables, segmenting and blending, which is what we saw in the video with the kindergarten kids. Looking at onsets and rhymes and then going full on into phonemic awareness where we're blending, segmenting, and uh, deleting sounds, substituting sounds, manipulating the sounds. So I want, this is the, all the same link here, but there are a number of videos from the Regional Education Laboratory Program at Florida State University. They do lots of things in Florida. I'm becoming more and more impressed. I feel like I wanna go spend some time there and maybe go to Disney World. So here, um, I clicked on this link that says multimedia. That's where the link in the slides will take you. And sorry, 
losing something here. Now well, let's go back. All right. Uh, multimedia. So what I'd like you to look at here are all of the different things that uh, we can focus on. So for example, uh, videos uh, 10 to 19. So 10 uh, looks at set sentence segmentation and there's the YouTube video like I showed you. Uh, sorry, that wasn't the sentence segmentation. That was uh, video 12, the syllables. But there's also segmenting compound word syllables and then videos with examples of rhyme, onset and rhyme, uh, phonemes, uh, phonemes like the letters, just the uh, phonemes themselves, letters and sounds, word building, and then letter sound, uh, phonemic awareness and uh, building that. Now, it's not that the others aren't valuable, but these ones um, are particularly focused on that sound symbol. So lots of research and lots of information out there. Um, with Alberta Education, back in March 2021, the focus was that mastering reading and writing to build a foundation for learning was the focus of the curriculum, to gain foundational skills necessary for personal excellence and coaching your job coaching students to constantly improve their literacy skills. And reading and writing will be taught with explicit instruction in sounding out words, phonics, and how to use proper grammar. Literacy is woven throughout every subject and grade in the new K-6 curriculum. So as long as we talk about what sounding out is, and is that phonics or is that phonemic awareness as well? So all students that you have should have access to teachers of reading. And then all teachers should have access to learning about reading. And then all should benefit from the instructional practice to support teaching and learning. We talked about uh, Nancy Young's Ladder of Reading and Writing and that spread that we can have in the classroom where we use a program like um, uh, sound walls in really being very direct and explicit in our instruction to those that bottom 45% and even more explicit to those that are struggling more. So we want to move away from the thought that we need to use flashcards. We say that word recognition is not based on visual memory. There is memory involved, but not necessarily through uh, flashcards. It is by sound symbol knowledge, and we want to store that into the long-term memory to build that automaticity. There are seven recommended principles and practice of instruction based on uh, Louisa Motes. This comes from her book, Speech to Print. And these are the principles of effective teaching of reading, spelling, and writing. One, the explicit teaching of phonological skills, sound symbol correspondences, and fluent word recognition. We have to involve text reading. Um, build vocabulary, um, build text comprehension, and build appreciation of literature. All of that falls in what is similar to the writing rope. Phoneme awareness instruction. When it's linked to systematic decoding and spelling instruction, it is key. It is key to preventing reading failure because while we do have some kids that can just move forward, we have some kids who can't and they're stuck. And they're the ones who you go, I don't know why they can't figure this out. And very often it's phonemic awareness is a challenge. The National Reading Panel noted that children who were taught to manipulate phonemes with letters benefited more in their spelling than children whose manipulation, manipulations were limited only to speech. It is better to teach the code of written English, English systematically and explicitly. We don't want to just have random incidents where we go, 
oh, they're having trouble with that short A sound. I'm going to work on CVC words and not have a plan where systematic approach is abandoned. Um, we want to be able to support with using the terminology, sound, symbol, morphine, word, even if it's only for our use. Daily exposure is so very important and not just the teaching of sound symbol, but to the use of text. Vocabulary is best taught with a variety of methods to explore the relationships in words. And this could be word structure, origin, meaning of words. And maybe we go deeper into this in more of our division two. Close reading is another strategy that we talk about, particularly in our upper elementary. Comprehension strategy should include summarizing, clarifying, questioning, the use of graphic organizers and visualizing. And these should be embedded in our reading lessons. Oops, I missed one. Uh, formulating questions uh, is also a really good tool that we can really understand how kids are comprehension, just or how they are comprehending just by the types of questions they ask. Effective teachers encourage frequent prose writing to enable a deeper understanding of what is read. So writing, um, even if it starts off as pictures or starts off as creating creative spelling is fine. <clears throat> I apologize, my voice seems a, a bit cracky, so. Hmm. So we learn to read from speech to print. We don't start with print and then move to speech. And that's very often what we do with kids that come into the classroom is we say, here's the word sounded out without really explicitly teaching that sound awareness. So we use sound walls because uh, they're approachable and used daily. We can build words and they don't even need to be real words. We can build nonsense words and that's perfectly legitimate. Um, we focus on sounds rather than letters initially and build that kinesthetic understanding. You don't just put up the cards. We have to have instruction that is planned and sequential. There are 26 letters in the alphabet, 44 speech sounds, 25 consonant sounds, 19 vowel sounds, and over 240 combinations of those sounds to create how many, I can't even, I don't even know how many words there are in the dictionary. Somebody should Google that. Okay, oops, let's see, where did my chat go? There we go. Um, so there are various kinds of scopes and sequences that you can look at. Um, Louisa Cookmotes in her book, uh, pages 285 to 291, has a suggestion of a scope and sequence. Um, and also like there's one down at the bottom there for keys to literacy has a suggested scope and sequence. Oh, okay, it doesn't wanna work. I will make sure I fix that link. Um, so the scope and sequence used uh, by Keys to Literacy, any scope and sequence, honestly, is really based on the belief of how you're going to go about teaching. Initially, what we say is that we want to start with consonants because consonants are easier and there's not a whole lot of variation except when we combine them. So this is what one can look like with a vowel valley and with the consonant partners. This one comes um, courtesy of Madonna Elementary out in Sherwood Park, um, where I did some work with them. And one of the teachers uh, started off with their consonants. Anything that she had not introduced yet, she had covered up. She put up everything but she covered up um, all of the sounds that she hadn't yet introduced. 
This is a vowel valley, same thing. Anything that had already been introduced was then um, uncovered. And she used the um, pattern, or sorry, the scope and sequence according to, I think this one was according to um, Keys to Literacy, I believe. This scope and sequence uh, looks at all of the consonant sounds. And then I'm going to show you a few more. This comes from this book, Why Your Child Can't um, Read and Spell and What You Can Do About It, lengthy title. Uh, this is written by Sylvia Hannah Sinclair. And she's in the process right now of updating it. But uh, she, she did her training uh, with the Linda Mood Bell people uh, down in California and San Luis Obispo. And she is quite the expert. And so she's based some of this work um, on the, on the um, San Luis Obispo or the Linda Mood Bell work. Uh, but she sort of morphed it into something a uh, little more user friendly. Her scope and sequence looks, um, goes by grade level. And even now she's saying that, you know, goodness, I, it is a suggestion to go by grade level. And so, you know, in, in her, in her work, he has in fact, you know, said, that you know, if I have it in my grade one lesson, then um, I could do that in kindergarten, or I could do that as an intervention in grade four. So there are word lists that are suggested. Some of them are, uh, sorry, I'm just trying to find the, no, it's not there. Um, I, so she will, sorry, I'm, let me, rethink that. Uh, her lessons then will focus on um, partner sounds, brother sounds or sister sounds. Uh, we say brothers or sisters because they are related, uh, but they are not the same. And so to say partners is kind of um, not really the same thing, but we could use that term if you choose to. So uh, Sylvia Hanna Sinclair was a reading specialist with Edmonton Public Schools for many years. She was one of my mentors. And so we've done some work together. Last year, she did um, a session on, um, it was a five part ses session on developing word accuracy. And we went through a lot of this work, but um, you can actually, go to, and I didn't put where it was from, I'll put it into the chat. Um, if you go to Lulu Publishing and you type in Sylvia Sinclair uh, without the Hannah, um, that's what she has it published under. So even if you just look at that up and just put Sylvia uh, Sinclair's name in, that's what you'll find. And the book itself uh, is about, I think it's about $60 Canadian-ish, or you can uh, actually download it as well with, for a little bit cheaper. So in any case, this is how she has organized the consonants uh, where she looks at the different um, brother or sister combinations that are similar that are not um, exactly the same though. So it gives a the consonant sound and remember anything within a backslash tells you to address it as a sound, not as the letter name. So p, b, t, d, k, g, and so on. So um, consonants and their keywords that you know you can say to a student, oh, it's like the 
in Pat, and we make those Q words. Uh, we talk about sounds um, in consonants that are quiet or noisy. And then the terminology she uses here, is it a stop sound? Does it go and then it just stops? Or is it a continuant like or where it continues? So then, don't worry, we're gonna go over those. Then there are the vowel sounds. And in the vowel sounds, what you have are all noisy sounds. All vowel sounds are noisy. Remember the noise comes from here. And so the vowel sounds are for Sylvia was organized into smilers, yawners, so smilers, yawners, rounders. So yawners are rounders are and movers and then the bossy Rs. And again, keywords and is it a stop or continuant and all vowels are continuant. Then we have the borrowers. These are letters that do not own their own sounds. They borrow it from other letter sounds, sound letters. So the letter C can be k, like in cat or s like in city. And then of course we have the rule that goes with it uh, I, E, or Y that comes after the initial sound. Then we have X. Now remember the letter X and the sound X are different. So we have X, but the sound is, um, can be Z like in xylophone, or more often it's X like in mix. And then it has those, that combination of two sounds that it borrows from. And in one case, you might find X is example. Q U uh, very often is the sound is k, k, like in quiet, quiet, or and occasionally it's a hard k, like in antique. And then Y of course borrows from E and I. And occasionally Y has an I eh, like in gym or I again, like in rhyme. So implementing this, what a business. Let's do some practicing. So what I would like you to do is to think of um, yourself. If you, if you have your um, camera on, you can look. Nobody's judging. And so we're gonna practice these sounds. Uh, we're gonna focus on the consonants and then we'll add in a few of the vowels. And how can we start creating, get kids to create words? And remember, it is a skill for students to be able to create and to read nonsense words. One of the assessments that I would do as a reading specialist, as I went to a number of different schools, is I would in fact um, do the um, phonological processing test, but I also did what is called the pseudo word decoding. And pseudo word means simply reading nonsense words. And what I was looking for to, that going beyond what students could just read a number of words and some kids are just word readers. But when I did the pseudo decoding, were they actually able to apply the rules of language and be able to read nonsense words? And it's a, it's a skill and it's important to practice. So again, let's go back to the consonants. These are the ones that we're gonna be taking a look at and practicing. So this will give you an idea. Now, again, as I would be teaching in the classroom, I would implement this in a couple of ways. One, kindergarten, grade one, even into grade two, I would do this whole class. And then I would, for those kids struggling, I'd have targeted small groups. 
I would introduce maybe two, maybe four, excuse me. Um, if it was kindergarten, I do two in a week and then I would introduce a vowel sound and then we would start building words from there. If I was working with grades four, five, and six, even in grade three, but for sure four, five, and six, uh, to introduce them to it, I would do all the consonants at once and implement it um, by adding in some vowels and then start building words. So it's not that they would be unable to, but um, sometimes it's just easier to do all of it um, rather than saying, oh, I'm just gonna start with the vowels. Well, unless you start with the consonants and get the process down, it is, honestly, it is much better to start with doing the consonants for the older kids getting it out of the way, especially if you're using it for intervention. So let's do some practicing. So when you introduce this, you're going to introduce these pictures and they can all be individual. And so when you introduce it, um, what I would do is I would make up very large um, mouth form pictures, you know, like poster size, and I would have them up. And then as we started learning the different sounds, then, um, and the letters that went along with it, then I would put those up. So in Sylvia's book, she's got a number of those um, that even you can uh, either enlarge or you can run off an entire page and give them to kids. And so lots of things that you can do. That's with her book. Now you can purchase all of these as well, these mouth form pictures. So in the mouth form pictures, um, you can even take pictures of your kids as they are making the sound and just take a picture of their mouth and put that up instead. And then we start adding in the letters afterwards. This particular one is a consonant um, poster that again, you would add in as you go along. That comes from this program, the University of Florida Literacy Institute Foundations, UFLY Foundations and Explicit and Systematic Phonics Program. Um, I found it unfortunate that they said it's a phonics program because the first, I wanna say 10 lessons or so is focused on building a sound wall. And this is what um, one of their sand walls could look like. Then uh, we have to remember when we are doing consonants. Oh, I wanted to mention too, the UFLY book, uh, before I forget, that book is about $70 Canadian. They charge $40 for shipping. I think I paid $100. I want to say it was 110 Canadian altogether. So if you get together with some people, they'll ship that book up to 10 books for a flat rate of 40 bucks. And of course, you pay for each book. So that's just a thought. Um, it's become one of my new favorite programs because it actually encompasses all of those phonological skills. It pulls in the phonics and um, starts off with the consonants. They have their own uh, scope and sequence as well. They have one that's designed for kindergarten, grade one, grade two. This is meant for K to two. Um, though in Canada, this is more like um, more like grades one, two, three, even into four. A uh, great intervention program for older kids as well. So we want to remember that when we're practicing here, we're using our voice box. Uh, we would have a mirror and we could use that to take a look at what is the mouth doing? 
We also use our hand to feel where the air is going, as in puff of air, and using our voice box to find out is there a vibration? Is it noisy or is it quiet? Like, b, b. So we're going to practice that. All right, so let's work together. And so your job right now for the next uh, few minutes is to look at um, the different sounds. So we're gonna start with lip puffers. So in lip puffers, what we're gonna do is we're gonna go, uh, we're gonna start with uh, the hand here on the voice box. And we're trying to create the because we're trying to puff the air out. And notice that that's just a single little puff. So um, try it. Does that make a vibration there? It shouldn't, it should be quiet. And so that sound then is the And that's where we say to the students, they're like, so if that goes, what letter might that be? And so that's when we start connecting the letter name to the sound that we're making. We want to be careful that we're not going p p. We're not adding an extra a uh to the end. And so it's p. All right. So we've named that. We've got p. So we're going to turn on our motor now. We're going to go p b b. And so same mouth form, except now we've turned on the motor. What letter is that? Right, it's a B letter. So now we've got our first partner, our quiet and our noisy, B, and same mouth form. So that's where I would put up the picture of the mouth form. And I would also then put up the letters. Now I might have all the mouth forms already up, but the letters covered and I would take them off as I go along. Tongue tappers. So again, and that's where I'm getting them to look at. Okay, well, where's the air? Where's my tongue? Where's my teeth? Are they like this? Are they apart? And then, t -t -t -t. is this quiet or noisy? Where is the air coming from? And so it is a quiet sound. And what letter is it? The letter T. Oh, okay, it's quiet. T -t -t. Let's turn the motor on. T -t -t. Duh, duh. And what letter is that? And D. So you may not go through these that quickly. And especially with the younger and kinder and one, could take a lot more time. The tongue scrapers. This one, sometimes you have to have a little fun with it. So uh, the tongue scraper is what sound goes at the back. So we're going, and, and the nice thing about, I should say about most of these programs that you go through is there is a script to follow along. You're not just left to the wolves. So, uh, sorry. So sometimes when I'm doing this with kids, I'll go and they'll have a little fun with understanding how far back that sound is. Where is the mouth? Where is the tongue? Where are the teeth? Is it quiet or noisy? Yeah, that's the letter K. All right, it's quiet. Let's turn the motor on. Oh, okay. So the noisy one, same mouth form, the letter G. Lip biters. So lip biters, kids have fun with because you know what's going to happen. Where's the teeth? Where's the tongue? Where's the lips? Teeth, tongue, lips. What's going on? Air is blowing down. 
quiet sound. What letter is that? It's the letter F. So let's turn on the motor. V, v. Hey. The nice thing is that what we're doing is we are getting kids to discriminate between the sounds and we're giving them a tool to be able to do that with. The tongue biters. Now, this is an interesting one because the spelling is the same for both. Obviously that's a TH, but it depends. Um, if it's TH and TH, there's a TH that's with, with ending in TH is quiet. But starting with TH, like in then, then, then is noisy. So that makes a difference as well. Skinny sounds. Teeth are together, air is coming out, and it's quiet. Obviously, this is an S. But what happens when we turn the motor on? Ah, now we've created our Z letter. This is where we start now building other kinds of um, digraphs that where we are taking two letters, creating one sound. So let's take a look at the fat air where we go. Um, quiet, where's the tongue? Where's the teeth? Where are the lips? Continuant air. And that of course is SH. Now the, that's a quiet sound, quiet um, the spelling that goes with it. The noisy sound that goes with it is not a sound that we use for, um, or not letters that we use for spelling, but it is a sound, remember, that it makes. <laughs> Turning on the motor gives us this sound. So if we think of the word measure, that is where you hear the sound. So we're not too worried about this one and with our younger kids. Fat push there, that means going back to this, that sh is a continuant. Fat push there is a pop. Ch, ch, ch. Quiet sound, ch, 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 ch. teeth, tongue, lips. Of course, that's CH, but what's the noisy sound? Ch, 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 ch. Ah, so once we start building this strategy for kids, they'll start playing with it. And the nosy sounds, the nosy sounds are made here. And then finally, this one here, the NG that we have in like sing. Mm, mm. These are all nose sounds. Then we have our windy sounds, our and then and then the WH. Finally, we have our lifters. Lifters are what's happening to the tongue. O, O, R. And both of these are noisy. O, R. O, R. That's what's happening to the tongue is it's going up and back. Now, I get com um, comments saying, well, you know, that's fine, but in upper elementary, that's not useful. Except it is, because this gives you an example of the alternate consonant spelling chart. So here we look at what do those sounds do beyond the sound that we originally gave them. So we know that the NOAA sounds, we can have K and N, 
knife. That's our no sound. So we do have lots that we do with consonants. It's especially true with the vowels. And remember, we have these borrowers that are borrowing from uh, different sounds that already exist. So it's kind of our exception or our rule of what those letter um, borrower sounds, where they borrow from. Um, this is, and there's another video for vowels, but this video uh, is a great tutorial uh, on consonants. And then there'll be another one on vowels as well. So I'll just play just a wee bit of this. And it's about 20, well, of course it does. And what was my... See, I should have opened this before. There we go. Um, so the videos, speech sound videos, this is the one for consonants. So like I say, it's eight minutes, almost eight minutes long, so I'll play a little bit of it. Hi, I'm Louisa Motes, and I'm the author of Speech to Print. And this video is to supplement chapter two in Speech to Print. I'm going to demonstrate and talk about the speech sounds of English. And the consonant chart. So now let's look at the chart and walk through the chart consonant by chart, uh, consonant using the IPA symbols. All right. I want to just uh, point out um, she uses the IPA symbols. IPA is International Phonetic Alphabet. Um, and so some of the letters don't look like letters, they look like symbols. Just kind of ignore that. That's not what I'm asking or expect people to use. Right, so in the front of the mouth, we have two what are called bilabial consonants, p and b. The top one, p, is unvoiced. The one under it, b, is made exactly the same way in the mouth, but the vocal cords are turned on. B. Both of these are sounds that are clipped or stopped. We, we can't continue to say them uh, <clears throat> over time. So I'll leave that there because, you know, it does go into quite a bit of, and her book, I mean, it's deep. It is deep in that it's, it, um, I did a book study once and I had a speech pathologist and she said, you know, that's a lot of lot of information, but it's really interesting information if you're interested. But uh, this is also very helpful. She's the expert. All right, now let's take a look at vowels. So this is the chart according to um, Sylvia Sinclair. And I'm going to play you a bit of this one from, uh, well, you'll get to meet her. She's always very excited, especially about vowels. All right, it's bow time. Who's excited? I'm excited. Uh, bow time, here we go. So uh, English bow phonemes by order of articulation. I don't know about you, um, but when I first started teaching can, uh, first grade, I taught my students that there were five vowels, A, E, I, O, U. Oh, well, you know, sometimes Y is a vowel. Well, and then that A, E, I, O, U, they have a short sound and a long sound. So there's kind of like 10, maybe 11. Well, when you count schwa, there are actually 19 vowel sounds. So it's really important that we um, be clear with students, that we understand this ourselves, and that we be clear with students and help them understand um, how the vowel sounds in English work. Now, there is a very specific uh, reason why these boxes, uh, which represent vowel sounds, are arranged in the way that they are. Um, we, we, this, uh, mimics the motion of your chin. So when we're making all of the vowel sounds, our chin starts very high and then comes down very low and then goes back up high again as the sound moves from the front of our mouth to the back of our mouth. Then we have some other uh, vowel sounds that are sort of outliers, which is why they're not along um, the, the chin valley, or we call this sometimes vowel valley. 
All right, so here's Val Valley all filled in. Um, again, we have schwa up here hanging out all by itself because, you know, it's just a little different. Um, and then we start here with a nice, you can put your hand under your chin, a nice high smiley. Ee! That's why uh, when photographers want to take your face, they say cheese because it has that long E sound in there that gives you that nice high smiley uh, look at your face. So I invite you to spend some time with Michelle Trussell. Um, she has, and I put the link near the end there, um, she has Samples 101, where she has a series of videos for each section, each uh, of the Val Valley and um, the consonant sounds as well, if you want some extra help with that. So this is one interpretation of a Val Valley or Val Circle. This one is from the LIPS program in Linda Mood Bell. And it looks at um, the sounds uh, a little bit differently than the one that Michelle Trussell just showed us. In this case, we have the sliders in the bottom, I guess my left, um, maybe it's your left too, um, where we have the slider sounds is where the mouth moves. Whereas um, with all of the other sounds, they, the mouth stays stationary for a sound. Then on the right side are the crazy R's or the R controlled vowels. So those are taught separately. And notice that in the case of the sliders, OI is OY and OI, and OW is OU and OW. So that's the ow sound, the oi sound. Then we have the u, u, and i, i. So when you look at um, the u fly, vowel valley, Michelle Trossel's vowel valley, um, the u and the i have actually moved. And I'll show you an example of that. But for now, we'll just keep this one. It's the one actually I was trained on and used for many, many, many years. So as Michelle had said that uh, your chin is going to move through the sounds. Now, part of it is that the sounds start here and they move to the back. And so that's the reason for the vowel um, valley, the way that it's visually organized. So. Today, uh, I'd like you to do this with me. So just repeat after me. And what I'm wanting you to feel is where, how is your chin moving? Okay. Yi, e, e. So I'll start again because I'm going too fast. E, 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 a, a, a. So notice that A with an E, U with an E, I with an E, and so on. What that means is that is the long sound. So A with a sign of the E says A. All right, do it one more time. E, I, E, A, 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 A. Three spellings for A. O by itself, like we say, A like in Bob. Um, a W all oh, like in Paul and a U like all oh, like in Paul. So we're at A, sorry, E I. Ah, I got my, my tongue tied. E I A A A A A. Then we're going back up O, O uh, like in book and O like in boot. So that's the vowel circle. And then of course our crazy R's. So that's one example of what the vowels could look like. This one comes from UFLY. It is the same as, the, as um, uh, Dr. Motz's vowel circle in that the I is over um, under, where did it go? Oh. Uh, it's after the A, a like an apple, 
and the they don't add the e to it what they do is they um put the line over if it's long um uh, if it's a long sound it's got that line over the letter and the other one is the u and that has moved up over to the near the end okay so uh then we've got oi and ow uh, as the spellings there as well and then our r vowels it's only showing the three sounds of the r vowels the r the er and the or because under er we also have ir and ur i just was always surprised that they didn't add the extra in there and i'll show you the louisa cook one uh, sorry, the Dr. Louisa Cook Motes one next. Um, so it's it goes along in the same way as the other vowel circle, and the only difference here is we've got at the top is a single one that is where schwa is, and that is what Michelle Trossel talked about. That schwa is there. Uh, schwa, remember, is a sound that um, shows up in words like fem, ah, uh, It has the ah uh, sound to it, ba, loon. And then this one is uh, from Louisa Cook Motes, very similar, except her R vowels um, are all spelled out there uh, more specifically. Then the long sound is the bar across, the line across the letter, and the short sound is that little. Uh, symbol above the letter. And of course, schwa is up there as well. Both spellings are also in oi and ow. So underneath here, what she's doing is she's adding uh, words as they have been um, like you would in a word wall, but uh, according to the sound that it makes. So if a student wanted to know, how do I spell eight? Well, where on the sound wall is the A sound? And they would look for it there. Thinking you've already done all this work, this is the reference back. So in the Lendermood Bell Lips program, we now start building for our older kids the alternate spellings for the sound. So for the first one, seed, the E sound, we've got E, 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 A, I, E, E, I, E, Y, and Y. And those can all make the E sound. Now, does that make it, that it won't show up anywhere else? Well, no, of course not. Because under E, there's the I and the Y like in Jim, but not I like Sky and so on. So this is just, some of it doesn't show all of it here. <laughs> the bottom part got cut off. And then again, here is her video for the vowels. So you might want to start in this way where you are teaching. So I've given um, some steps you can go through to make words with kids. Teach a couple of consonant sounds, teach one, maybe two vowel sounds, start with those smile sounds, um, give them a word containing or, or have them make a, uh, give a word with one sound, a word with two sounds, vowel consonant, and three sounds, consonant, vowel consonant. Keeping in mind that um, this is all specific curriculum patterns that they're being asked. So you can work with a blending board. Remember I mentioned about Elkonin boxes, or you could just um, draw this and use little bingo chips or whatever. Um, you can create your own blending board. On the Youthfly Foundation's website, all of this stuff they have there for free. They have a ton of stuff for free. So you could, and I'm going to have to just go back to my slides here. Why does it have to go right to the end? I don't know why it has to flip back to the beginning. So for example, um, you could, you know, the word is dog. Where do you hear that? There's dog, d-og. Where do you hear the d? 
right there. Where do you hear the g there? What do you hear in the middle? Ah, d, og, dog. So we're blending sounds. Uh, making words uh, continuing, we add in other consonants, create other words, add in other vowels, and start building. Thinking of your vowel, vowel, consonant, consonant, vowel, consonant, consonant, vowel, consonant, consonant, and so on. Then you could create a, a word wall that you have just the sounds uh, or create it right onto your vowel. Um, vowel circle. So your vowels um, sound wall, not vowel sound wall. Uh, this is a consonant sound wall. It's also a vowel. And this is the initial sound, the beginning sound of what a sound wall could look like, where the initial sound is the p, t, d, and so on. Oops. Oh. Something happened to my vowel sounds. Oh, well, you get the idea. So there's a video here from Patton. They have a lot of work that they do on sound walls. How do you introduce it? But the basic is you start slowly. You start with the idea that this is phonemic awareness. Follow a scope and sequence. Your sound wall should be empty or covered. And just go one phoneme at a time. Lips, teeth, tongue, and what's happening here? Use a mirror. So the idea is that in a lesson, all of this is explicit instruction and it's direct. Strategy instruction, modeling, demonstration, we're always giving feedback as we're going along. Oh, that didn't work, try this and guided practice, independent practice, repetition, visual supports, and transfer. And we have to use decodable books. So I'm moving really quickly. I'm being aware of the time. Is anyone, I haven't even asked if anyone's had any questions. Um, please put them into the chat, add them onto the Jamboard. Jamboard is still back there up on the chat. I don't think anybody came in new, but I will post it a second time just in case. I know when people come in new after I post something, I need to post it again because they don't have access to the chat. All right, so decodable books. So I have lots of people ask me, um, why can't I just use my level books? because there is a difference between decodable books and level books. So here we look at decodable books that are phonetically decodable. The words are controlled vocabulary. In level books, the text is meant to be predictable and it, the words don't match the phonetic skills that you're teaching. And so here's an example of a level book. This one comes from the Learning Hub. Uh, so for example, what words in here are not decodable? I like could be decodable if you've taught that, but we've got cats, bunnies, turtles, and dogs. And if we go by what is the three queuing system, does it look right? Does it sound right? Does it make sense? Is there a picture that would help you? All of that we need to move away from is that we have to remember that guessing is not reading. So while leveled books um, are, are fine for building and working on decoding, or sorry, on comprehension at a later time, not for the purposes of teaching decoding. This I have a link here, it says the Learning Hub. It's not from the Learning Hub. This is from Flyleaf. Um, I will fix that. And what we wanna do here is look at what's happening. This book is longer than these four pages, but I just took a screenshot. So we've got Sam, consonant, vowel, consonant. We are deleting a sound. We're going from Sam, we're going to M. 
uh, take away the what's left, M. Now we've got vowel consonant. I am Cam. Now we've substituted. We've taken um, Sam and we've taken the K uh, and changed it to a K. Um, for M, we've added a sound. And then we've uh, substituted again from K to S. So that gives you an idea more specifically of what that difference is. Um, decodables are written carefully for patterns and level books are not. So here's some other information on decodable books and various levels. This one here, this link goes to Reading Rockets. I like this one because this talks at K2 and the links are all there. Some of them you have to pay for, some are free. Grades three to eight for all ages and then teens and adults. So it does give you quite a range to support kids with their decoding. And I know Sylvia, uh, Hannah was there, Sylvia Sinclair was telling me um, she was tutoring, um, I thought it was a teenager, but I think it was an adult, young adult, like early 20s, um, and going through all of these skills in teaching sound symbol awareness. And to do that, he was just amazed that he didn't know any of this. So those decodable books are helpful. So a literacy uh, lesson has a warm up a of a sound, review, new rule, practice the rule, activities, and, and building on those skills. This comes from the UFLY. Oh, I forgot to mention. Um, I'll, I'll talk about it in a minute. This is a lesson plan that a UFLY lesson would follow. Phonemic awareness tells you the materials and what are you doing? What is the strategy? What is the instruction? Then a visual drill, auditory drill, blending drill. There's a link to a blending board, um, new concept. And then in day two, review, do word work, um, tackle an irregular word, and then use text. So, one of the things about the UFLY Foundation's website is they have a link to a ton of uh, decodable text. They're one pagers, blank box that kids can draw in, and then a piece of decodable text. And again, that's all free. So sound walls, remember, vowels and consonants. Um, or not, or sorry, vowels and consonants are sound, not letters. Letters represent sounds. Letters don't make sounds. Phonemes are units of sound. Graphemes are the letters that represent sounds. And that we can make a series of uh, lots of graphemes to make a word. Daily review, make sure you're setting that time aside. Repetition and review are important and use decodable books. So sound wall, 50% of the words are predictable by rule. 36% um, are predictable except for one sound. 10% of words are predictable with morphology and word knowledge. And only 4% of words are really, truly irregular. So there's the link to Michelle Trossel's um, videos and all of her different things that she's working on. And this is what you look like when you're teaching sounds. And I'm not sure where I got this from, but it just cracked me right up. So this is what you look like when you're making sounds. All right, so you're doing New Learn Alberta. Um, lots of different diagnostic tools that I've added in here and uh, the Hagerty, every time you go into this Hagerty one, you have to give your name and email, but it's fine. Uh, the phonological awareness screening test, uh, this is, I'm checking the time. 
Um, this is by David Kilpatrick. And then this one looks at, can kids do that substitution? This is for various grade levels, substitution of sounds. And then the Yop Singer phoneme segmentation. I really like it as a quick and dirty one where you have 22 words and mastery in kindergarten is 90%. So can they hear the sounds in a word? It's really quick and individual. All of these are individual. And then the phonological awareness screener, this one gets really deep. The right to read screening assessment um, built here in Alberta, there is a cost to it. So it's just something to be aware of. Your sound letter correspondences. And when you click on the pictures, when you get the slides, the, it'll go to the link of sound letter correspondences. And grade one, there's 60. In grade two, there's 120. That doesn't mean that we can't focus that on grades three and up as well. You want a group for literacy where you're starting looking at various elements of what you're going to do in literacy um, centers. When you are doing the guiding, reading instruction and targeted instruction, what are the other kids doing? So I, I, I'm um, going to show you this particular site. This is uh, from the Florida Center for Reading Research. See, I told you they're doing all sorts of things in Florida. Now, they have pre-K, K, one, two, and so on. Really, uh, the pre-K is K. Then we have uh, grade one and two, three and four, five and six. That's how I read it because they start school a little differently down there. So for example, if I went to the second and third grade, there are my five pillars, phonemic awareness, phonics, fluency, vocabulary, and comprehension. So if I wanted to um, click on one of those, it'll give you the lesson and something you might do with the kids first and then when they go to the center, but it gives you the lesson it gives you a visual of what the materials that you need, what they look like. And then it gives you the things to photocopy. So it's all done for you. And you just need to take a look. So if kids are going to a certain center, you might want them to focus on phonemic awareness or the phonics piece and so on. Oops. Whoa. <laughs> All right. Uh, this one can go into a computer center, really great reading tiles where they can go and manipulate and pull the letters around. Yes, for elementary and junior high. And morphology is a really good place to focus on. Morphology is about using uh, prefixes, suffixes, base words, and so on. Structured word inquiry is part of that. This comes from the work of Peter Bowers, um, who did his PhD in this work here in Canada. And then there are programs that have a sequence. This is the link uh, to the UFLY Foundations. This is a do Google Doc that I put together, not that I wrote the book. <laughs> I should make that clear. Uh, where you can get phoneme and graphing cards, uh, this, if you're interested in the Linda Mood Lips program, uh, if you are interested, I don't know why this is on here. I have to fix that one as well. Uh, slide. Um, this bottom part should be on the next page. So there's the link to the Lips program. This is for purchase phonological awareness stories. Oh, that's why. These little stories here that are uh, sold by the Linda Mood Lips people, those were written by Sylvia Sinclair. Um, and they sell it there as well. Sorry, that was the link. Um, that's why that link is there. This is the link to her book. And remember, just go slowly. Confucius says it does not matter how slowly you go as long as you do not stop. Every chance, every student deserves a chance at literacy 
and the most common source of reading difficulties is poor phonemic awareness. Here's a bunch of links to various books and articles. And I'm doing sound wall sessions to dive deeper for other people. Um, if, you, if they are interested, then please take the time um, to share it around. So they'll be in January and again in April. There's a fun video to take a look at. Otherwise, we're done. I'm sticking around if you have any questions though, happy to help. Sorry, I feel like that was just way too much. So thank you for being here.